there's the no fly zone um, that's implemented, and of course, um, a series of military operations that uh, degrade uh, Gaddafi's uh, military capacities. Um, and so Gaddafi becomes unable to um, destroy the opposition, and what then emerges is a kind of military stalemate out of which some kind of diplomatic um, solution can be reached, and maybe that would involve um, Eastern Libya achieving a kind of um, a, a Kurd-like status, right? That it would be um, a, a, a sort of practically autonomous region within Libya, but nominally it would be part of, of Libya. And, and so that's, that's, that's one possible outcome. Another possible outcome might actually be the deployment of UN, UN peacekeepers uh, to Libya as opposed to American troops. And, um, and in any event, when, when one thinks about um, the, the Security Council mission and the, the deployment of troops, the, 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 the objective is, is not to win um, in this sort of situation, but to protect. And, uh, and, and I think that there, there is, you know, having undertaken this intervention, there is a moral obligation to protect. Thank you very much, Dr. Copeland. Uh, as a follow-up question, uh, Secretary Gates has said that he didn't expect to uh, stay in his job uh, in the entire Obama administration, or this entire first term. Secretary of State Clinton has said that she doesn't plan to serve if President Obama wins a second term. Uh, how significant are these announcements to our current strategy in the Middle East? And what would you like to see a new Secretary of State or a new Secretary of Defense do in order to ameliorate relations in the Middle East? And why don't we start with Dr. Coughlin? Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, there's one sort of adage in international relations that, uh, um, um, that the, the friends of states may change, but the interests of states are, are permanent. That, that might also <coughs> apply to policy makers, right? That, you know, just because we have a different set of policy makers doesn't necessarily mean that the, the interests of the United States have, uh, have necessarily changed. Well, um, but the interests of the United States might change. I mean, it comes back to the whole question of, of energy and, uh, and what kind of energy policy do we have? And, uh, and you know, a lot of people say, well, the United States doesn't have an energy policy because they haven't responded to you know, the challenges of global climate change because we're unwilling to regulate uh, carbon emissions. But I think our energy policy is essentially our foreign policy in the Middle East. Right? That's been, become our kind of surrogate energy policy. And, uh, um, and I, I think we might reach a point um, where um, new policymakers are going to need to consider um, some kind of strategic disengagement um, from the Persian Gulf, um, you know, particularly in light of the kinds of budgetary problems that are beginning to emerge in, in Washington. Just, just a quick note on, on Libya. I was listening to the, the NPR show Marketplace, and, uh, and they were suggesting that uh, um, expenses in Libya could, could ratchet up quite rapidly and so to pay for the intervention in Libya, um, the Obama administration might need to present some kind of supplemental um, funding bill to Congress if Congress is not in the mood to spend money and Congress has not been consulted on um, um, this Libyan intervention. And so, you know, that becomes problematic. Well, these types of pressures, you know, might actually uh, lead to um, a, a significant change, and we might adopt um, a real energy policy someday, as opposed to um, our, our foreign policy functioning as a kind of surrogate energy policy. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Dr. Shambayati. And again, the question has to do with if there's a change in who heads the State Department, who heads the Defense Department, will it make a difference, and what would you like to see in the future? In terms yes. of the, the, the lecture I was giving in class today was about that how it doesn't make any difference who their top policy makers are. That's why we have bureaucracies. And as Rick said, that in terms of interest, at least, uh, there was not the, the fact that there would be a different sector of state or sector of defense does not change American interest in the region. Uh, at least that's the assumption here. Now, the style of policy making might change, but that's a different issue. Uh, I think that what the author should keep in mind is that the US interest in the Middle East goes way behind, beyond uh, energy or 
uh, terrorism or with Islamic fundamentals or any of that. Middle East has been an important region in the, in the politics of the world for centuries, long before <laughs> oil become an issue. And it is both the location of it, what happens in the, in the region as a whole, uh, affects not only the countries that need to be concerned for the Middle East, but also Central Asia, but also Africa. So, so it's unlikely that developing an energy policy or reducing our, in our dependence on foreign oil would actually change the, uh, our interest in the Middle East uh, to a great extent. Uh, having said that, obviously, we do need an energy policy. And again, independent of whether that is because of the Middle East or not. The Middle East can be extremely stable as it has been for many years, but we still need to have an energy policy. And we do not have one uh, at present. Uh, so I think that we should, we should distinguish between that, that our interest is not only energy and oil. And even if we find many other sources of energy, we still have, Middle East will still play a major role in, in determining U.S. interests. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. George, would you like to respond? Yes. Um, I wish uh, that that was the case, that the, the bureaucracy was indeed that powerful. I think that's how it, it should work. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think the, the Bush administration and what happened after 9-11 was proof that it's not so much a question of uh, if the Secretary of State changes over or if the uh, Secretary of Defense changes over, but if we have a change of administration. And when we talk about democracy, uh, we have to understand that the vision of democracy that people in much of the rest of the world, particularly in the Middle East and places like e Egypt uh, is a good example that I can speak from some experience. When we talk about democracy in this country, a lot of times it's coming from uh, a certain ideology where their idea of democracy is anti-government. Uh, it is uh, you know, talking about the, the role that the, the oil interest and the energy policy plays. Essentially what's happening is there's a really strong ideology in this country that's saying, look, let's minimize the role of government, let's get rid of social welfare, uh, let's let business run everything. And that's what gets us into the, tr the trouble that we get into a lot of times. It's not simply that the national energy pro policy is a problem, it's the fact that the energy policy is driven by a very small, limited number of very powerful and very wealthy corporate interests. And when people on the right talk about democracy in the Middle East, their vision of democracy is no social welfare, uh, let private companies run everything, let private companies run the oil companies, and they'll agree with us that America can do no wrong. Now, what the protesters want is something very different. For them, democracy is, first and foremost, it's about self-determination, Secondly, it's about human rights. And third, uh, the economic situation, because of the level of corruption uh, in these countries, is, is so terrible that social welfare is an important aspect of what they expect from democracy. Now, um, you can look at somebody like Mubarak or, or Ben Ali, and they are actually much closer to uh, some of the people that seem to be getting elected to office uh, and governorships around this country uh, than what the people who are protesting them think of as democracy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to another issue. Uh, Dr. Copeland had mentioned issues of budget concern, and this uh, relates to that, and especially to collateral beneficiaries of defense contracts and also outsourced groups, uh, Blackwater, for example. Uh, in this current budget cycle, how would you like to see Congress handle these sorts of contracts and these sorts of relationships? Should they be severed? Should they be altered? What would be your ideal? What do you think would be best for this nation uh, and also for our interests in the Middle East? And uh, why don't we start with Mr. George? Uh, realistically, in this congressional cycle, in this budget cycle, uh, nothing is going to happen. Those interests are going to continue to remain and they're going to remain powerful. Uh, I would like to see those relationships severed because I think you have to make a very clear distinction between what is in the private individual interest and what is in the interest of the public good. Now, for the private sector, you have business, you have corporations, you have non-government organizations uh, that, that try to take care of that sector. In the, the public sector, you have government. And democratic government is, is hugely important, not just as a principle, but as, uh, as an act of force because in a business, and I have no problem with the business world operating this way, but in a business, whoever owns the most part, the biggest chunk of the company controls everything. In a democracy, it's one person who gets one vote. Now, the two of them together should balance each other out. What's happened, particularly in this country, but also uh, in the developed world uh, in general, 
is the private sector is swallowing up more and more of that government sector. It's swallowing up more control of the government sector. And the net result when we talk about these groups like Blackwater and all these other organizations is they're putting a profit motive where no profit motive should exist. A soldier should not be there because he wants to make uh, $200,000 a year. A soldier should be there because he believes in his country, he believes in the cause that he's fighting for, and he's defending his comrades. When you put that profit motive in there, you ruin everything. And that profit motive will eventually take over to the point where all we want is we want this continuous perpetual war because it's continually creating profits. And that's the situation we need to get away from. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlson. Well, um, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to echo some of those thoughts. Um, I think that, uh, for example, when one looks at you know, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and some of the other rich um, oil exporting countries in, in the Persian Gulf, um, they also buy lots of uh, weapons systems from, from the United States. And, uh, and you know, I, I think it's, it's likely that um, defense expect defense expenditures in the United States uh, might be cut uh, very sort of moderately um, or might not be allowed to grow quite as much. Um, but one, one of the things that, um, that, that we saw in the, in the early 1990s, um, after the end of the Cold War, is that when defense expenditures um, were reduced in the United States, then, um, then um, defense um, Defense contracts abroad to foreign governments increased, and uh, um, and uh, that's what picked up the slack um, for you know powerful defense contractors in the United States. Um, in the case of Bahrain, right, the, you know, the United States um, is, um, is 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 siding with uh, um, with the monarch in, in Bahrain, and you know not calling for uh, a regime change, but uh, for dialogue you know, between uh, between the monarch and the protesters in spite of the, the brutal repression that's been going on in Bahrain. And, uh, um, and, and, and part of this is the result of a lobbying effort uh, that was uh, directed largely at the Pentagon that got the Obama administration to kind of change its mind about uh, standing up for democracy in Bahrain. And, uh, and a lot of the Persian Gulf countries were saying, look, if you want defense contracts from us, uh, you need to support the monarch here in Bahrain, otherwise um, that's going to have consequences for future defense contracts. And so I, I think that that kind of speaks to this, this whole question of, of vested, vested interests in, uh, in, in, in the making of American foreign policy, and I think uh, it's all very problematic. Thank you, Dr. Shambayat. Uh, I don't know if I qualify to answer that question or not, but just uh, from my perspective, I mean, this is a style of American decision making. Uh, in all areas, the, the business sector is also very much involved in policy making. And so, so in that sense, these new contractors or military contractors are not very different. Now, of course, this is not a new topic. General Eisenhower warned about the, what was the military industrial complex influencing policy. This goes back for many years. And I don't think this, gonna, uh, this much has changed there. What I'm more concerned about is the two points is that uh, protracted conflicts uh, challenge the, the, the principle of the civilian authority over the military. And I think that we have a problem there, or, or, or a developing problem. More importantly, the other thing that concerns me about the, the contractors that we use now is that the question of accountability and responsibility. One of the advantages, at least from the military perspective of using these contractors, is that they are not bound by the same rules of engagement, they are not bound by the same uh, international treaties on human rights and the treatment of, of the uh, detainees, and so on and so on. But that also creates this problem of then who is responsible. Uh, at this, uh, and, and in terms of the public opinion, it doesn't matter whether the, the, the American soldier, or is it, is it an American soldier and an American contractor that is shooting that Iraq? from the perspective of the Iraqis or the rest of the Middle East is an American who's doing it. And so that division, again, is more for the purposes of the, I think, of the US foreign uh, decision-making process and public opinion than in terms of what's happening on the ground. But I think the bigger concern should be this question of accountability and uh, what is actually happening on the ground with the, this heavy use on, of the contractors. Thank you very much. 
I'd like to offer another question. Being a, being a journalist, I certainly want to ask you about your perceptions of media coverage uh, of the Middle East at this time. Uh, certainly there's a lot of criticism about insufficiency. Uh, there's uh, some media outlets perhaps do better than others. Give us your sense of, of how the media is covering the present situation and what does it need to do to improve? Um, why don't we start with Dr. Shambayat? Uh, I've got to think about that for a few minutes. <laughs> okay. uh, again, I mean, this is not just the Middle East. This is the style of the media coverage in the United States. Uh, very few of the American news agencies have any kind, any kind of local bureaus in any of these countries. Uh, I often joke with my students that when Tunisia happened, the first thing Anderson Cooper had to do is to try to find out where Tunisia is, actually. Uh, but we have created that style. We, we like to send the same reporter or the same anchor to, the, to that place and say, okay, here's the prices now. You go there and for a night to run the show from there. And that has been a problem. So we have, it's not only in the Middle East, it's also in Europe, it's also in Asia, it's also in Japan. We are doing the same thing. And if you've been playing, uh, I mean, what has been interesting again in terms of the Middle East is that it's Al Jazeera. That is the lead source of news, not only for the uh, Arab publics, but also for most of the world, and in fact for most of the uh, governments. Western governments are getting their news from Al Jazeera. And this, of course, is a news outlet that the United States actually tried to shut down after the Iraqi, after the, uh, I guess, the Iraqi invasion. Uh, it didn't succeed, and Al Jazeera's coverage is problematic, but Al Jazeera has the advantage of having people on the ground. And the one news organization, of course, in the United States that has actually some local ties is PBS or NPR, and they are in big trouble. Uh, but even they, they primarily rely on BBC for their foreign reporting. So I think this is, again, a style of the American media coverage that has basically meant that you have the reporters in New York or in Washington and try to report from there. And that means, of course, that uh, their reporting is very much superficial. Uh, and it's not only in the Middle East, but in general, I think. Thank you very much, Mr. George. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent point. And uh, the reason we got to that point, uh, and you can talk to some of the media professionals that are in this room after we get done, and I'm sure they will uh, verify this, is because of the enormous commercial pressure that's on the media. Uh, I think you still have, in American media in particular, you still have a lot of integrity on the level of the reporters, on the level of the editors and the producers. Unfortunately, what they're allowed to cover, where they're allowed to base themselves as foreign correspondents, or how long they're allowed to spend on the story, uh, depends on what the corporate level media uh, tells them that they can spend. So the news has gotten shallow uh, for the same reason what we were talking about earlier uh, with, with the energy policy. Basically, you have the private sector uh, who in this case isn't infringing on the public sector, the government sector, but on what should kind of be a third leg of that tripod. You have the private sector, you have the, gov you have the public sector, and then you have the media sector. I hate to say media because that limits it, but basically you should have a section of the population that their job is truth-telling. These are the scientists, uh, these are the journalists, these are the storytellers, uh, and these are the spiritual and religious leaders as well. They should be a separate leg that supports uh, a society separate from government and separate from, from private from money interest. And if you have those three interests together, uh, supporting each other, you have a very solid, stable tripod of balance for a society. Uh, when you let one of those sections overtake the other sections, and in this case, what we're seeing at this point in history is the private sector is kind of overtaking everything, you go from three legs to two legs to one legs, and that's not going to stand. Thank you very much. Well, I guess I'd just like to briefly uh, second what uh, uh, Bhutan and Jeff have suggested. But, uh, just, just a you know, just a quick little kind of anecdote. A um, um, long time ago, when the, the ABC used to have the Bible of Sports, and uh, Bruno Arlich was the director of the Bible of Sports, and it was very entertaining. That, Bruno which went on to be, you know, the producer of ABC News. So, you know, the idea is that, you know, news could become uh, an important profit center within these corporations, and that's been, that's been the model. And, uh, and I think, as, as Jeff is suggesting, you know, that uh, um, uh, news um, and, and journalism um, should be understood as a public service. And uh, um, so, so I just, I, I agree with the, what the other panel said and suggested. 
Perfect. I'd like to open this up to uh, audience participation and questions. Uh, and I know that you have your note cards. If you have any note cards you'd like to hand us, and we'll be happy to ask the panelists here. Sorry. I want to thank you very much for coming and for your interest. <laughs> Well, initially, let's uh, start with questions with the, with the foreman. If we have enough time, we'll certainly uh, entertain that. Well, no, I uh, let's take this first question. Uh, the profit motive is meaningless without a viable planet. How can we convince the U.S. and other global powers that we should train armies to prevent, mitigate, and deal with climate change disasters, protecting and conserving resources and people rather than profit? And why don't we give it to Dr. How about Dr. Kaufman? Okay, very good. Um, well, I think that uh, I think Jeff, you were you were talking about the importance of uh, stronger international institutions. Um, Barack Obama said something like this too in his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. He quoted uh, John F. Kennedy. He said, "You know, we should, we should, uh, we we need a peace not based on some sudden revolution in human nature, but on the gradual improvement in human institutions." And uh, and I think the United Nations is is one place to look for that. Um, and as I was suggesting before, um, with, with peacekeeping missions and the, the evolution of, of the doctrine of peacekeeping, um, I think this is significant where um, you know, the goal of, of peacekeeping is to protect, right? It's not to win. And uh, I think in some sense, this represents um, the, um, the growing, it represents a possible way of, of, of civilizing the use of force, and uh, um, and so um, you know, in, in, in the midst of, of of everything that's wrong and problematic with the present, this is at least you know a model that I think we could try to cultivate, and uh, and this idea of you know protecting the lives of civilians can be applied to um, you know regions experiencing. Um, uh, civil conflict, and it can certainly be applied to um, the kinds of conflict situations um, that are likely to emerge as uh, as climate change unfolds. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. George. Yeah, I, uh, I I certainly agree. And the the issue, uh, if you go if we go back and we look at 2002, if we look at 2003, uh, you may recall President Bush saying that we are not going to engage in the process of nation building. Uh, in his mind and in his administration's mind, the Army was for conventional warfare and nothing else. Well, very quickly, they ended up being engaged in the process of nation building, and it's a big chunk of the reason why we're in the quagmire that we're in now is that they didn't realize that from the beginning. And uh, the military uh, can't be a tremendous force for, for good and for positive development. Um, and by that, I don't mean using and the use of force. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous resource of manpower, of engineers, of a lot of people with a lot of technical ability, a lot of tech and skills, uh, who can do a lot, of, uh, a lot of things besides just shoot people. And in the American military in particular, the American military is a very middle class institution. Um, you know, in America, if you're middle class and you want to go to college and you want to get ahead, the military is an option. In America, if you're wealthy, you go into uh, defense contracts. That, that, that's your angle. Uh, so I think there's a lot of people in the military, and the officers and in the enlisted corps, who would love to see the mission change. And uh, we talk about energy and oil policy and how it affects the Middle East. That all comes under the broader heading of the environmental issues. Uh, we need a better energy policy, not just to prevent these sort of conflicts, but also because uh, we need uh, to treat the planet better. We need energy uh, form, forms of energy that are, are not going to have the negative effects uh, that they have on the environment. So I, I think uh, that sort of use of the military can happen, but in order for that to happen, we've got to go from a nationalist mindset, we've got to go from a business-driven mindset to a more international, 
UN global type mindset like Dr. Coffin was talking about. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, I think the only thing I have to add to that is that we have to go way beyond just the national mindset. We have to accept that uh, as Americans, we have a lot to learn from the rest of the world. And as if you're talking about here. And I think part of the problem we have, uh, the ideas of peacekeeping, of protecting civilians, and all of that are very uh, important ideas. I think international organizations play an important role. But the unfortunate thing is that in the present world system, uh, these are also expressions of power. And so it is not merely a matter of protecting the Libya, the civilians in Libya, but it's also it's a reflection of the U.S. interest or the French <coughs> interest in taking action in Libya. And of course, I mean, as written now, this has been a long debate in international relations going for centuries about, in fact, uh, what kind of circumstances would, would require the use of force or the, the less use of force. And many people would argue that if you look at the, the danger in Libya, it's not merely that Libya, but if this becomes a practice, that we're going to go around the world and protect our civilians, it's actually more dangerous than let Libya go. Now, that's a very difficult decision to make. But there are also dangers in what is happening in Libya uh, at present. And if that becomes the model, it can have its own problems. Thank you. Uh, next question, is Israel's policy of West Bank occupation the elephant in the room that has the U.S. State Department in its sphere of influence? Why don't we start with Mr. George? Um, the, that is a huge factor uh, in some of the things that are problematic about our foreign policy with the, with the Middle East. Um, there's, uh, uh, as you pointed out uh, earlier, you know, uh, the Iraq war sort of took some of the, the focus away uh, from the Palestinian situation. But the Palestinian situation, it's still very, it's still something that mobilizes, uh, particularly in the Arab world, it's something that really mobilizes people and, and people really focus on. And more than the political ramifications of it, we have to kind of look at the ethical ramifications of it. Uh, when you talk to people in the Arab world, um, they like Americans. They love the American ideal. They hate the hypocrisy of our foreign policy. And we are, when we're backing an occupation, uh, as we are uh, with, the Israeli, uh, with the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, when we are actively engaged in occupation, as we are in Iraq, in Afghanistan, no matter uh, what kind of uh, support that we give to somebody in Libya, or that we give to, to, to the people in Egypt, they're going to be suspicious. So I wouldn't necessarily isolate the Israeli situation as a sole root cause, but it is an important factor into what's going on, and it's something that we absolutely have to address, but we have to address it in the larger context of, of our foreign policy actually being about democracy and human rights as opposed to just security and stability. Thank you, Dr. Shambayev. I think the Israeli or the Israeli-Palestinian situation is a complicating factor. And I think for two reasons. One, I mean, as you were mentioning, it points out to the hypocrisy of the US position. So I imagine that much that there is already debate in the Middle East that why should the United States or should the West protect civilians in Libya but not in Gaza, uh, which also was a start of an air raid uh, a few days ago. But I think more importantly, it's also a complicating factor in terms of the uh, the United States relationship with Arab countries, or the best relationship, I should say, with Arab countries. I think one of the differences in terms of democratization that we talked about, that if you look at democratization, for example, in Eastern Europe after the fall of Soviet Union, the local populations in some places like Poland or the Czech Republic was sure of the Western support. In the Middle East, they have always agreed that whatever Western support that comes for democ democ democratic forces in Egypt, would be secondary to the support for Israel and would be subject to control of what actually serves the, uh, the Israeli interest. So if you've been following the news, a lot of the concern about, uh, for example, the situation of terrorism is not necessarily terrorism against the United States, is what effect would it have on Israel? And that is a complicating factor that we have. Now, added to that is, of course, we have a humanitarian tragedy in, in the Palestinian territories. Whether you agree with their position or not, there is a uh, major humanitarian problem there. That needs to be resolved. Thank you, Dr. Carlton. Uh, well, um, I, I think that you know, Jeff and John covered that question well. Maybe we'll go on to the next question. Okay, perfect. And then we'll, we'll we'll have you start with this next okay. question, then, for sure. 
Uh, does the current bombing campaign in Libya allow for future interventions in similar situations? Is this a precedent for later intervention? Uh, yeah, and I think that's the point that Khan was, was, was uh, touching on. And uh, I, there's a, an author, um, Thomas Barnett, who wrote this uh, article and then a book that's called The Pentagon's uh, New Map of the World. Uh, in 2003, on the eve of the US invasion of Iraq, and, uh, and Barnett said, okay, we have a functioning core of the developed countries, and then the non-integrated gap of these underdeveloped countries. And, uh, and so it must be the mission of the United States to, to integrate this non-integrated gap and to make it you know, part of, uh, of, of, of the global um, economic and, and political system because national security, our own national security, requires global security. And so what Barnett was suggesting was a kind of uh, recipe for, um, um, for you know, virtually unending intervention um, in, uh, in, in the global south. Um, so, and I agree, you know, that's not viable. Um, that's, that's a completely unviable notion. And in fact, um, you know, maybe one should think um, in terms of, uh, you know, if one thinks in terms of isolationism, um, and, uh, or, or at the very least, the less interventionist um, foreign policy, then, and then, you know, one would conclude, for example, looking at Afghanistan, that you know maybe it's the Afghans that can best sort their problems out, and it's you know it's not a a um, a U.S. responsibility or even a U.S. vital interest um, to determine the governance in, in Afghanistan, and uh, so I I think that's important to consider, right? The the idea that you know if we believe in the self determination of of other peoples, then um, then that means that uh, you know, other peoples are going to need to sort their own problems out. And, uh, um, and so that's, that's, that's a point of view that's, that's really important to, to, to think about. Thank you. Mr. George? Uh, can Libya be a model for, for uh, future intervention? Uh, ask me in a week. Uh, I say that because it depends on if it's successful. And by successful, this is how I personally would define success. If we go in there, uh, like we talked about earlier, we, we take out these military assets, uh, and then aside from enforcing the no-fly zone, making sure nothing gets in the air, from there we essentially take a hands-off position, and this has to happen in the next few days. If we take a hands-off position and say, okay, now it's for the Libyans to work out, and then within a reasonable amount of time, the situation improves in Libya. That might be regime change, I hate that term, but you know uh, that might be one thing, or it might be a number of other possible political settlements. But, for it to be a success, the Libyans have to take charge of the situation. If we continue to bomb, uh, and if we continue uh, to intervene and nothing moves on the ground from the Libyans themselves, then it's a failure. And will that be a model for the future? Well, it's basically it's the same model that we've been working with uh, all along. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, I think Libya is a very difficult situation. Uh, the action in Libya comes out of the failure to act in Rwanda. Uh, I think that is what the driving force has been to do something. Uh, this is part of a doctrine of the, what is responsibility to protect. That has been pushed by the human rights community for since Rwanda, <coughs> that our failure to act in Rwanda led to a genocide. And of course, I mean, the other example that we had is the failure to act in, uh, in Iraq in 1991, when the, when the first Bush administration called for an uprising and then it failed to protect the courts for the Shias. So this is part of the problem there. Now, the difficulty that we have is, of course, the, the responsibility to protect idea is problematic. One is that we cannot enforce that uh, universally. We cannot send troops anywhere that there, is a, that there is a violation of human rights by the government. So that is, it creates a sense of hypocrisy. It is also problematic because we actually, it has to be preemptive. You cannot wait till after the genocide has taken place as it did in Rwanda to intervene. So you have to intervene in a situation like Libya, but that of course for me is that we actually don't know what was going to happen or what was happening. As, as crazy as Muammar Gaddafi might be, we don't know what the outcome would be. I think the, the more difficult problem that we have is the no fly zone. Uh, I mean, I don't want to put the time limit in it, but basically we have a couple of weeks to make this work. If it doesn't work in a very short uh, speed, it's not going to work. And we're going to be stuck with a situation as we had in Iraq, 
no fly zones are defined, but what they mean is that they basically divide the country into two halves with no end uh, in sight. And at the end of the day, as in Iraq, we had to send troops in to basically to be able to remove the no-fly zones. And Libya is, is also a very dangerous place. And I think the danger in Libya is even higher because uh, what hasn't been mentioned in the news much and is not covered is Libya is, does not have a, uh, or the problem in Libya has always been that there is no state structure. Libya, it has, Libya along with Yemen have one of the weakest state structures in terms of institutions in all of the Middle East. So the hope that the Libyan military will stage a coup is, I think, unrealistic. There is no institutionalized military that can act there. There is one person, everything is dependent on that one person, more than anywhere else that we have in the Middle East. And I think that institutional weakness makes Libya extremely dangerous. Now, the other side of the danger is, of course, is that if Libya does not work, then it would also become a deterrent to act in other humanitarian crises in the future. So there is also that precedent that can be set, which is also an equally dangerous situation. Uh, but I was very glad that as that uh, the President Obama did not consult me in terms of what decision to make. I would not have been able to give him a good advice I want to do here. Well, the question that's appropriate for this organization for EPEC, uh, perhaps, but how can we strengthen our government's attitudes towards creating a peaceful conclusion that can be interpreted as winning? Uh, why don't we start with Mr. George? Uh, are we talking about Afghanistan and Iraq, or are we talking about uh, Libya, or just these conflicts in general? I would believe it's these conflicts in general. For, I'm not sure who asked this question in particular, but, um, but let, let's take it to the general situation. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, what we have to do right now is, is we really have to uh, stress that this is part of a process. Uh, that so often we talk about Libya or we talk about Iraq and we say, what's the end game? What's the end game? Well, once you stick your finger in the pie, once you've initiated this kind of intervention in all of these situations, the end game isn't going to be a date on the calendar. Uh, it's going to be a process. And what we have to do to encourage it to be a more peaceful process is we have to uh, accentuate the